Turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, and beginning in verse 13. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, and beginning in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and did you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What you need to know and to begin to understand about verses 13 to 15 that we can look at today in Matthew chapter 3 is that they mean absolutely nothing if we do not get to 16 and 17. And indeed, the way gospel, uh, Matthew has written this part of his gospel, the emphasis is very clearly on 16 and 17, and rightly so. 16 and 17 reveal one of the fundamental doctrines of the church. It is a grand theological vision here at the commencement of the earnest earthly ministry of Jesus. And this, this, he's about to begin his preaching and teaching ministry in his moving very rapidly now towards the cross, establishing his kingdom and truth. And here he is commencing that. But to fully appreciate what is happening in 16 and 17, we need to understand what is happening in 13, 15. There is no feeling so desperate and so prone to despair and yet so prevalent, so common in our day and age as to feel as though one is well and truly alone. There is nothing so damaging, so tasking on the human condition as to feel that one man must stand alone, an island unto himself. It is a wretched thing. And yet, this is a condition that most of our hearers, most of them, hear coming into the time of the year when they'll begin showing the previews for your summer blockbuster. And very many of them will begin with an old world. God, man. It's always one man. One man! It's always one man. Always. Unless, of course, it's a chick flick. In which case, they don't tell you so obviously in the preview, but it's still one woman. And even when we arrive at a situation where we have a team in a movie, whether that be the Avengers or whether it, it be the core cast of the original Star Wars trilogy, it is not so much a unity as it is a grouping of individuals. stories that we tell, we tell for a reason. The heroes that we hold up, whether they be superheroes, or action heroes, or sports heroes, individuals for a reason. They're held up for a reason. They reveal something fundamental about our thinking, about our understanding of the world, the way that we view ourselves and the situation 
around us and what our culture is pounding into us day after day, moment after moment, is self-reliance. It is sending us the message that not only should we stand alone, but at the end of the day, they're sending us the message that we have to stand alone. There's really no other choice. There are some aspects that are trying to change this view, but they're all hopeless. They're all hopeless. Our culture might send us some messages. They might sing every now and then, we all need somebody to lean on. They might tell us once in a while that no man is a rock and island unto himself. But even all humanity standing together is such a thing where it would be possible, which it isn't, not since the Tower of Babel. <coughs> but even if it were, they're <coughs> still calling us to self-reliance. They're still calling us to a lonely existence. And it is no wonder, then, that we see mental health degrading rapidly all around us. These statistics about the prevalence of anxiety and depression and suicidality, all of these things, and the increase we see in there, all of this, it should not surprise any of us. The church should not be wringing its hands going, what is going on? We ought to be the one voice in the midst of this chaos going, we have the answer, for indeed we do. We know how to solve the problem because we do know how to solve the problem. We have a solution because we know the solution. The fundamental truth that Christianity is built on solves the fundamental problem of a humanity that feels like it's on its own. Let me pray. Father, I am not alone. Help me to rest in that truth this morning. Lord, make it apparent to myself and to everyone else who will hear these words that I was not alone, that you were with me and speaking through me, to me, to my brothers and sisters gathered here and to the whole of the human race yet again, the same message you have been telling since the beginning of time, since our struggles began, which you have made profoundly evident in the last 2,020 years. Lord, let it be heard again. Let it resonate deeply within us. Let it mark us in an indelible way. Let these truths Become a part of who we are. May everyone who encounters us see someone who is not alone, who is not self-reliant, but who is abiding in a life far greater than any human life. Let that life abide in us all to your glory. Lord, all the glory be to you, for you alone are worthy, for you alone are able. Have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very interesting passage we have arrived in. It's a very interesting passage, and to understand what is so interesting about it, the first thing that we need to remember from the previous portion of this chapter is that John is out here in the wilderness of the Jordan, 
and he is preaching a message of repentance, and he is baptizing people for repentance. In other words, the people who are coming out here are being preached a message of you are wretched sinners who are dead in your trespasses, and you need to completely turn around and go in the opposite direction you are going now and live an entirely different lifestyle, or else you are surely damned. It's a hard word. And they are receiving this word, and in recognition of this word, they are being fully submerged in the River Jordan and brought up as a sign of, I am washing away everything that's come before. I am washing away this lifestyle, and I am coming up out of this water to live a different way. That is the, the baptism that's going on here. And it is being offered by a man who has just finished saying in the last couple of verses that the guy that's going to show up in 13 to 15, he is not worthy to take this man's shoes off. Now, we need to pause here and get a little cultural context from the time that this is going on because uh, it will help us understand just where John holds himself in relationship to the Messiah. In our modern context, taking someone's shoes off might not be the most pleasant thing we could do today. <laughs> but the chances are, all of us have taken a shower in the last week. And we've had good shoes on to cover our whole foot when we come in here. And we probably grew and we've probably only been walking on surfaces that have been cleaned in the last week. At the time this happened, they were in shambles, and they are walking everywhere, and they are walking on dirt, a dirty road. No vacuum cleaners, really no point in sweeping because you're just moving the dirt around. And they don't bathe as frequently as we would. They just don't have the means. And so the, the feet that you're dealing with here, they are very, very dirty. The task of removing the shoe and washing the foot at this time, that was reserved for the lowest of the low the most menial of all of your household servants, the guy at the very bottom of the pecking order, that's the guy that gets to do this. And John is saying here, I am not even worthy to serve him in that capacity. Like, I can't even be the lowest guy in his service. I am not uh, able, I am not fit even to remove his shoes, even to get down next to his dirty, stinky feet. And yet, in verse 13, we are told, then Jesus came, and Jesus did come. He came about 70 miles, by our estimation. But Jesus did not just happen to walk out in his backyard one day, and John's there, and he's like, oh, that's cool, John's here, baptizing people. That looks like fun. I'm going to get out. Jesus has come here for a purpose. He has gone out of his when he has made a special effort to come to John. From Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Jesus has come out of his way. He has made a purposeful trek across the country to get to John to be baptized. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? This is a baptism of repentance. Jesus is the one person on the face of the planet who does not need this baptism. He is not sin. He is not going to sin. He is perfect. He does not need to turn around and live the opposite way. He doesn't need to repent. There's no way he could do that. And in fact, we would think that for him to repent would be a sin. And yet he is here to be baptized 
And he's going to be baptized by John. Verse 14, John reacts exactly the way we would expect him to. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Yes, he does. And you come to me. John knows what's going on here. He recognizes the Messiah when he sees him. He knows that this man has a baptism that is greater than this water baptism. John is basically giving people a point of reference. He is giving them a public statement of the heart decision they have already made when they come to him to be baptized. There's not a lot of power there. But now he's standing before the one who has a powerful baptism, who baptizes in the power of the very Spirit of God with fire. This is a guy who can give you a baptism that really does something. When God brings these people up out of water, they are the same people that went under, just with a new revolution. We know how revolutions go, don't we? I don't even remember what my revolves were last year. I'd probably given up. Baptism has nothing to offer Jesus. John has nothing to offer Jesus. So why is he here? It doesn't make any sense to us. It doesn't make any sense to John. In verse 15, Jesus was going to turn this whole thing on its head. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus says, John, we have to do this. Because this is the right thing to do. The words we translate righteousness there, your Bible may have something slightly different, but the basic idea of it is, this is the will of God. Very similar to the words Isaiah the prophet is going to use as he talks about the coming servant who is the Messiah, who is going to purposely fulfill the will of God the Father. And that same term is being used here, hearkening back to what has been prophesied. Now, here he is in the flesh, arrived on the scene just as you would expect him to, and his concern is to do exactly what you would expect him to be doing. And still at the same time, we're looking at this and going, well, what is God's purpose in this? In one sense, it does not matter. It does not matter. And the sense that it does not matter is if you're John the Baptist, which you're not. But to John, this, this is enough. This is enough that it's the will of God. John has to understand nothing else but that it's the will of God that Jesus be baptized by him. That is all the information John needs. all the information John needs. And it's really all the information that we need. Yet so often we look for more information than that. So often we want the will of God to make sense to us as though God were somehow operating on our level. Is it not written that God's ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are higher than the earth? God is looking down on all of this. He has a totally different perspective than us. And we have one perspective. And it's a low perspective. It's the perspective that I've been preaching this passage from. 
if we really believe God is God, if we believe that he is the being, then what no greater can exist, that he is perfect, as he has told us he is perfect, that's what it means when it says that God is holy, he is whole, he is complete, there's nothing lacking in him. If we believe all of that, then we ought to have the same reaction that John did. We ought to consent. We ought to consent. We ought to consent. We ought to consent not only because we know that God's ways are higher than our ways as the heavens are higher than the earth, not because we realize that whatever God is doing is a million times better than anything we're going to come up with. We don't just do it because we realize that we're looking at a mirror dimly, as Paul will say, and that God knows perfectly what is going on. Because we have a greater revelation. We have the revelation of Jesus being baptized. When these people are coming to be baptized, and they're baptized for repentance, and they're going under and coming up and saying, I'm going under, I'm washing away all of these sins, I'm coming up and I'm going to live a different life for God. What they are saying underneath that, the implied remark they are making is, I am ready for a fresh start with God. I need something new with God. I want a better relationship. I want to be able to draw closer to God than I am now. So why is Jesus here being baptized? It's not because he needs to repent. He has nothing to repent of. It's not because he needs the recognition of John. He doesn't. Jesus isn't there for Jesus. Jesus is there for the people who have been baptized. So what Jesus does when he shows up at this point is he is saying to all of these people who are saying, we are ready for a fresh start with God. He is saying, here it is. Saying, we need a new way. We need a newness of life. And here he comes, the true vine, the real life, the source, the light, which is the light of men has arrived on the scene, and as he goes under the water and comes out, the profession that he is making is here it is. I am with you, Emmanuel. God is with them. He is not just with them in the flesh. He is not just walking among them, but he is with them in spirit. The thing that they are looking for is the very thing that he has come to accomplish. He is there to make baptism meaningful. And when we get to verse 16 and verse 17, and we see the Trinitarian display, and we hear the voice of the Father from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. What he is saying is that he affirmed the statement that has just been made. This is why he is here. He is fulfilling my purpose. He is bringing my kingdom to earth. He is announcing my covenant. See, the perfect Lamb of God come to take away the sin of the world, standing in solidarity with those who have confessed their sin and who are desperately looking for a way out of their captivity to sin. Here it is, standing alongside them. Point is baptism. It's the point of the gospel. If these men were just left there being baptized and Jesus never shows up, they are still damned. There's no hope for them in this baptism of John unless Jesus comes and is baptized the same way. See, man is hopeless on his own. That's the whole point of the Old Testament. Every single book of it, every single story is there to tell you. You can't do this on your own. You can't do this on your own. You can never do this on your own. No matter how good you are, no matter where you are positioned, no matter what is going on around you, you will always fall short of the glory.
glory of God. The whole point of the covenant is to say, here is the bar of perfection. Try to jump over it. You can't. And have faith that someday I am sending one who will clear that bar and who will destroy it. And who will give you a perfect life in him. He comes in solidarity with those who seek freedom from sin and closeness to God. He comes as a manual for those who desire a manual. And this we must be crystal clear. We must be crystal clear on this point. Who is he standing with? Who is he there for? Because if we get that wrong, verse 16 and 17 are only going to hurt us. If we get that wrong, we have misunderstood the whole story and there is no good news. We lost it. And this is pressing on me. Because our country has become the sewer from what spews forth a whole flood of wretched counterfeit gospel that caused people to be damned without realizing that they're damned. And they all get it wrong at this point. They all get it wrong about who Jesus has come to seek and to save. They all get it wrong about why is he being baptized? Who is he announcing he is there for? Who is he seeking? What kind of people? What are they looking for? Now, as soon as I said these words, some of you have immediately gone to the most prominent, the most visible, and the most insanely obvious. Of all the false gospels, which is the gospel of prosperity, who said that Jesus has come been baptized to show his solidarity with those people who want stuff. Stuff. Temporal stuff. They want to live their best life now. When we get to chapter 5 and we look at the Beatitudes, we are going to utterly destroy the idea that your best life can really be lived now in the sense that they mean it. We are going to obliterate this idea that you can have your cake here and then eat it in heaven too. It doesn't work that way. The only way that it could possibly be true that you have your best, most enjoyable, most fulfilling life now is if you're going to hell. Jesus did not come for those people. You know who those people were? They're the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They got sternly rebuked a couple of verses ago. They got told, you are heading for damnation. Unless you become like the people who are being baptized, unless you admit that you do not need these useless things you think you need, what you need is to be right with God. There is another derivation of the gospel. There is another lie, a false gospel that is spread that would take off the flat point. They would agree with everything I've just said. And they'd say, yeah, that's right, because the people that came out there to, to Jesus, they're the poor people, they're the rejected <coughs> people, they're the oppressed people, they're the enslaved people. And then they start identifying. They're, they're the minorities. They're the LGBTQ. They're women. They're the disabled. There's this and that. Whatever group imagines that the whole world is out to get them, they're going to say, oh, this is liberation here. Jesus has come to free the captive. Yes, he did. But the captivity of being born to a certain race or being born a certain gender or being greatly confused about what gender even is, it does not compare with the true captivity Jesus came to free you from. You're going to live under an oppressive regime. That is nothing compared to the oppression of the wrath of God that is hard against you until you repent and receive his gift of grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Until you become one of the people who is being baptized. 
I understand. I understand a little bit about the appeal of that theology. But even in my condition, even if there are days that I wake up and I go, all the world is a prison to me, that is nothing compared to what my lot was when I was enslaved to sin. Jesus did not come just to free you from temporal oppression, whatever that is. And he certainly didn't come to free you from oppression if that oppression is suffered because you're living in utter sin. He came to free you from sin. And if you don't think that's good enough, you're a lot worse off in sight than I am. He didn't come for something as small as that. Now, we could go on and say there are parts of the gospel that imply that there should be no tyrannical government regimes, that we should not judge people on the color of their skin and what ethnicity they happen to be. In fact, the Bible explicitly denies the whole concept of race because we all got off the same boat. More importantly, we're all in the same boat, all in need of grace. And there are those derivations of the gospel that would agree with everything that I've said thus far. So they would disagree with me on the very first thing I said after reading this passage. They would disagree with me that we need Jesus to be there to stand with us in order to have hope. These are the Mormons. These are the Jehovah's Witnesses. These are, to some extent, the Catholics. The pre uh, the the Episcopalians, they're trusting in works. They get grace by doing things. Those are the Pharisees, my friends. They are the ones who are saying, oh, I don't really need to be baptized. I don't need Jesus to stand with me. I don't need him to come to me and to be with me in body and in spirit because I can go to him. No, you can't. an explicit denial of every gospel that sees the work of man as central. That sees that we have some great thing that must be accomplished. The new apostolic reform in there, I forget how many mountains they have to conquer right now. I think it keeps growing. I don't care if they conquer 12 mountains. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it's about what they're doing. This passage not about what we do. It is an explicit denial that we can do anything to save ourselves. Whether we put our hope in some kind of miraculous outpouring of spectacular signs and wonders that we're doing, or the mantles and spiritual giftings of the saints who have gone before that we somehow suck out of the grave and put on ourselves like our superhero capes. Or whether we think that we can go around and knock on all the doors with our bicycles and our black ties and somehow earn our way in, or whether, like the Jehovah Witness, we think we can show up at every door and somehow make the cut to get into whatever class of heaven we're filling up right now. Whether we think that there's a political gospel that the moral majority can somehow turn the world around and usher in utopia or whether we put our trust in the law, and if we just do the right things on Sunday morning, and we say all the right words, and we don't do the don'ts, and we do do the do's. That was a really stupid sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we can get to where we need to get going. This denies all of that. All of these other gospels, it just throws them in the trash and says, get rid of them, get them out of the way, because the real thing is here. And all these other gospels are no gospels at all. In fact, they're not even worthy of being called good at all, because they're the opposite of good. They are damnable lies straight from the pit of hell, meant to keep people from recognizing what has happened in this three verses. What has happened in these three verses is that God himself has come down to earth 
and he has called us once again, come to me, repent of your sin, repent from all of the stupid stuff you've been trying, repent from all these desires that will never fulfill the true desire of your heart, and come back to me. And in the one to do, he comes to them and he says, I am with you. The way is going to be open. Hope has arrived. Faith has turned to glad fruition. Martin Luther got it right in his great song, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. The enemy is more powerful. There is no rival for him on earth, as the song said. And we're the right man, not on our side, all is lost. Praise be to God, the right man is on our side. His name is Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of rest. He has come and he is standing with us. What is the application here? The application, my friends, is baptism. And what it means, firstly. That's the smallest one. But it's important. When it comes to baptism, we make two mistakes. Either we devalue it or we overvalue it. We ought to say, this is absolutely essential to go to heaven. But what about St. Disney? What about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. There was no way. Didn't happen. And yet our Lord himself promises this man that this day you will be with me in the kingdom of heaven. Baptism is not essential. But you go the other way and say, well, it just doesn't matter. It's just a choice we make. Well, what do you do with the Ethiopian eunuch? What do you do with these examples throughout the book of Acts where somebody gets saved and the very next thing is we need to baptize? And what do you do with the Great Commission? Go there for preach, baptize. What do you do with the example of Jesus? Either way you go, you diminish the gospel. The reason that baptism exists is because of this. When we go under the water after this fact, we are not looking for someone we don't know. We are still coming in the spirit of those who were baptized before Jesus by John. We are still saying we are starting something new. We have become a new creation. The difference is that now we really have. We're not looking forward to it. It's done. And so when we go under the water, rather than looking for Jesus to come and stand with us, we are now announcing, I stand with Jesus because he's already come and stood with us. We say it today when we sing victory in Jesus. He loved me ere I knew him. That word ere means before. This is love. As John writes in his first epistle. Not that we have loved him, but that he first loved us and sent his only begotten son to die for us. Jesus sought me when a sinner wandering from the fold of God. To rescue me from danger. When you go under the water, that's what you're saying. He saved me. He gave me a life. I seen the light. And it is abiding in me. I am abiding in him. I am something new. I have been baptized with the spirit and fire. And now so that everyone knows it. So that all my brothers and sisters who are walking alongside me and who will come after me can know that this is who I am and who I stand with and what I'm all about. I am going to show you. I have been buried with Christ in his death. And I have been raised with Christ in the newness of the life. That is a powerful statement. There are people, there are people who say, well, it's not necessary for my salvation, so I'm not going to go there. Look, if you don't think it's necessary, the testimony of Acts is pretty clear. You're not saved. This is commanded as obedience. 
Not only that, even if Jesus didn't command it, even if it was just optional ordinance, I think if you were really saved, you wanted to do this because you're in love with this guy. You're in love with what he's done. You're recognizing all these wonderful truths, and you're going to want to go back there and tell the whole world, hey, I found the thing. I'm not alone anymore. I found the answer. I found the person I was always meant to love. I found the direction for home I have always wanted to go to. I found the work I was always meant to do. I found life more abundant and free. People still find life. Jesus is a good leader. A good leader does not ask his people to do anything he is not willing to do. A great leader does not ask his people to do anything that he has not done. Jesus did it first. He wasn't ashamed. Even though he had no reason. Even though even John is looking at him going, you're crazy, man. We can't do this. Still done it. That's how much he loves you. He wants you to know it. He said it here. A couple of years later, he said it by pouring out his blood on the cross. If he wasn't ashamed to die that most humiliating death for you, how can you be ashamed to stand with that man publicly? Why on earth would you not want to stand with God? That's the greater application here. If God is for us, who can be against us? He is. In the most necessary way, He is. But he's not for us when we want the new Lamborghini. He's not for us when we want a bigger house. He's not for us when we want the hottest life. When we want the most money. When we want a disease-free life. He's for us in a better way. He wants the very best things for us. And the problem is that we don't always know what those are, but he does. Calling people to that's who he's standing with. That's who he died for. Because we see in a mirror darkly, because we still live in a fallen world under the effects of the curse of sin, we still feel alone. I feel alone all the time. I'm prone to it. We feel alone. We're alone. We feel alone. We're in a crowd of people. We feel very alone during this holiday season when we're away from friends and family. But here's the beautiful truth of the scripture you're never alone. Never. And if this was all I had to go on today, if I had to look at you all right now and say this story here, the story of the incarnation, Jesus being baptized, this earthly ministry, this is, these stories have to sustain you. I would have no problem telling you that this was enough, that the ministry of Jesus was enough, that Jesus coming as Emmanuel was enough, no problem at all. But he did more than that. I didn't appreciate what I'm about to tell you until I was in Louisville, Kentucky at seminary. My family was four or six hours away, no friends, out of the South for the first time. Very alone. God knows we are people that need to see things in a microcosm. He knows that for us to understand these truths and to feel these truths, he knows that to minister his love and his grace and his mercy to us, he needs to send it in a package that we can embrace. That's why Jesus took on flesh. 
so we could behold his glory and glory that he was the only begotten of the Father. Jesus ascended, but then he sent the Spirit, the very Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, not to dwell with us only, but to dwell in us, so that the truth of John 15, 5 would indeed be true to the Holy Spirit. He who abides in me, I abide in him. surrounded by those who are filled with the Spirit of God and who are equipped to minister the love of God to you. John 15, 5 says that the one who abides in Christ, Christ abides in him. He it is who bears much fruit. I got out there to rule the lighting still alone for very long because I got plugged into a faith family by the grace of God that really was a faith family. I loved them, they loved me. We were very different. Had a lot of arguments. Okay, had a lot of disagreements. Had some, some really hard times with those people, but I loved them. And they loved me. Not because I'm so lovable. I'm sure you figured out by now that I'm not. Not because they were so lovable, well they were, but because all of us loved Jesus and Jesus loved all of us. Amen. That's the beautiful thing about a church that's working properly. <clears throat> that you can bring in the lonely. You can bring in the lost. You can bring in the tired, the weary, the huddled masses find something there they cannot find anywhere else because God is particularly present through the presence of his people. Jesus stands with you and he did not leave you to stand alone. He built these communities for you to be a part of. For you to commit to, for them to commit to you to minister this love between each other, to remind us of the beautiful truths of Emmanuel, to preach the gospel to each other, to take us closer to God together, to share the journey and its joys and its sorrow, all of that. He showed us how, and then he gave that to us as part of the ministry of his gospel. I cannot this truth well enough to you to appreciate what this means what it means that he stands with us how that's ministered to us is not something that can simply be imparted from behind a pulpit or a lectern or before a chalkboard you have to live it you have to consider it as you're living it and only then will you begin to fully unpack the richness of what seems so simple. <clears throat> the wonderful mystery brought to you by the wondrous mystery of Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that we were not left to our own devices, that we were not left to our own powers and futility to toil endlessly and achieve nothing. I thank you that you have stood with those who are seeking you, that you have said the one who is earnestly looking for you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. I thank you that you stepped down out of glory 
to walk with us, to talk with us. I thank you that we now have a great high priest who even in our greatest prayer is standing there next to you and praying alongside me and saying to you, these are my people with whom I have stood. I was baptized in solidarity with them. They were baptized in solidarity with me. Hear their prayer, Father, and answer them as it is in your will. Thank you that by the intercession the Holy Spirit has sent God to us, so that even as I say these words, the Spirit is crying out within me and within my brothers and sisters here, and within this place, if your will should be done, and praying with groaning for the human mouth and not utter for that which we most need, the things that even we ourselves do not recognize we ought to pray. Lord, I thank you that you are Emmanuel. I pray, Lord, that we would come to understand what that means and that we would be a community where that is obvious to everyone who steps foot on this property. That they would know that God is here with these people. That they would know what that means. That it would set them thinking. Lord, I pray it would be so with every church I pray that these false gospels that lead people astray, that preach them some little truth that can't compare to this great truth, I pray that it would be the Father. That it would vanish from the face of the earth when they were sick. That those who proclaim it and preach it and from whom it comes forth, I pray that they would repent and come to Christ. And that their people would be made to repent, come to you. Lord, have mercy on them. Have mercy on all we have afflicted. Have mercy on us also where we fail to realize who we are, who we stand with, who stand beside. Your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen.